It's been a while since I've been in a room like that. I'm just tempted to write things on the whiteboard. And whoever uses Chrome. Um, anyways, so uh, I'm here today to talk to you a bit about HTML5 beyond the hype. And uh, as it's very confusing for developers to talk about HTML5 uh, and about the web and everything is changing right now. A uh, bit about me, I'm Chris Heilman, I'm the HTML5 spokesperson for Mozilla. I work on Firefox OS and I work on making developers into presenters by teaching them how to do public speaking. So a lot of the people outside that you're meeting today will be, help, will be helping you out later on when I'm gone. Because there's many things that are beautiful about Hungarian and easy, the language isn't. <laughs> So far, I only spoke uh, with a few people, and most of them uh, start speaking to me in French when I don't understand them in English. I speak French of sorts, so that's okay, but it's still completely confusing. My favorite were people in the hotel, Americans, like, do you know why there's Italian flags everywhere around here? <laughs> and you're like, you know the 90 degrees thing, like, that's a different bit here. Like, it's very, very interesting, but yeah, I'm only here for a day. So I'm happy that I have Mozilla people outside that if they have questions later on as well, they can send them forward to me as well. So what is HTML5? A lot of people tell you different things. It's like the flash killer. It's the best thing ever. It doesn't work. It works. It makes you prettier. It really makes the computer faster. People tell you all kinds of stuff about it. In essence, it's just the evolution of web technology. We had HTML for a long, long time when I was still young and had all my hair. We, uh, we actually had websites out there already. 1996 is when I, when I sold my first website to somebody. And uh, then we realized just a few years ago that the web is moving away from desktop computers to mobile devices. And mobile devices had different needs. And even on the desktop, we had different needs. We didn't want to have uh, documents any longer that link to each other with a bit of forms in them. We wanted to build applications. We had Flash that showed that applications can be done on the web, but the native technologies weren't good enough. You couldn't do video, you couldn't do audio, so we enabled the technologies by writing new standards and implementing them in browsers. So HTML5 grew up to be an, uh, an apps platform. And the beginnings were very promising. When the first iPhone came out, we finally had a reason on mobile to say, like, yes, HTML5 is the way to go. Because uh, Steve Jobs went on stage and said, there's no SDK required. The web is the platform, Safari is the browser that enables you to do everything on this planet and never has any problems. He had a few mistakes there and that changed afterwards as well. Out of a sudden everything became native and everything is like, okay, the web is nice, but it's this like last app you will ever use on your phone. And that we thought wasn't uh, fair to the web because it, it has a lot of merits that native platforms just don't have. And nowadays we face realities of HTML5 that are a lot different to that. This is uh, caniuse.com, a great website if you want to know if you can use something, as it's said in the name. And this one shows you the performance uh, or the, the support of different technologies in different browsers. And this is form validation, basically input type required. That means that if you don't enter that input field, the form doesn't get sent off. Awesome. You don't have to write JavaScript to do that. The user can never send in bad data. And it's supported in all the browsers, including Internet Explorer. So Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, all of them do fine, except for iOS Safari, Opera Mini, and the Android browser. All the browsers that actually shouted that HTML5 is the future don't give us basic functionality of HTML5, which is kind of bizarre, but also really, really annoying for us as developers. So we have to find a way around that, and there's no better way to, find, uh, uh, to get somebody to do something than to be a better competition. So there's a great uh, uh, survey, and this survey is happening right now as well. So they're asking developers about their information, what they want to have from HTML5 and, uh, and platforms and all kinds of things. And this one asked, how can HTML5 compete with native? So this is the URL, don't need to write that down, the slides are already on SlideShare and I'm sending out the links afterwards as well. It's a really great read because it gave us a lot of insights. A lot of browser developers create a lot of new technology because we think you might be needing it. But these kind of surveys give you the information that you really need and there are a few surprises in there that make us change right now. One of the things was the uh, developer said they cannot do HTML5 instead of native applications because the lack of APIs. 63% of HTML5 mobile developers go directly to the browser when developing a mobile website or app. 
Yes, we use browsers to surf the web. We also use browsers to build applications with. However, the browser, the browser is the most popular route, yet 61% of Android apps cannot be implemented via the mobile browser due to lack of APIs. You cannot access the camera on Android directly from JavaScript. You cannot access the accelerometer on old iOS. All these things are not available to you. The other problem that they found is that 37% of Android apps could be implemented using HTML5 via the mobile browser across the platforms, 49% via PhoneGap to actually pre-render a native app from your HTML5, and 98% via Firefox OS. Why is that number so high? Because Firefox OS is written in HTML5 instead of being a native application that helps HTML5. It's, in essence, it's a broken comparison. When I say, like, can a native app be as good as an HTML5 app, those are two different things because of the nature, because of what they want to do. So if you see a different goal, a native application provides the best experience in a defined environment. It's fixed in a current state. This game now works on iOS 7. iOS 6 doesn't get that game. Android have to wait five months to get that game. The idea about native applications is that you squeeze the last bit out of the hardware that you have in the current state. I used to write games and demos for Commodore 64 and Amiga. I knew everything about that machine. I knew every chip, I knew what it does, I knew where, it, where I'm going. I could do 3D animations that people thought were never possible of this machine. Can I reuse that code anywhere else? No, I can't. And it's the same with native environments. The web, on the other hand, the goal is to reach the largest amount of users, regardless of location, technical environment, or ability. This is why the web was defined. Everybody is invited. A developer in Uruguay, in Peru, in Hungary, in Germany, they're all on the same level. You don't have to pay to start developing. You don't have to wait for hardware to start developing. You open a text browser, and uh, a text editor, and you start building things. So it's fiercely flexible and adapting. Things that I've written in 996 on the web look awful, but they still work. They're not blocked out. The browser doesn't tell me I don't know what that is. It's still the same technology, just enhanced. It's also different approaches. A native environment innovates with closed, patented technology and secret features to gain advantage over competitors. Do you know what's coming in iOS 8? No, you don't. There's lots of rumors going around. You learn when it comes out. The same with Android. Android comes out as open source, and then two weeks later you get the source code. That's tada source, not open source. Like, haha, we're here, now fix bugs for us, help us please. So either it's, beginning, uh, it's open from the beginning or not. And the idea of native environments is that you have quick results, no visibility, and constant replacement. There's not even an interest in making the thing backwards compatible because you want to sell new hardware. You want to make it better. And that's not a bad thing necessarily because it gives you a great environment that's safe and secure and you have the best tool chain. But always be aware that it is just fixed in time. And in half a year's time, it might be different. Remember all these people that said like HTML is not good enough and we now learn Silverlight because that's the future? They're not too happy right now. Same with Java Web Start or Java Applets. The web, on the other hand, use browser maker innovation to agree on standards, stay backwards compatible, and vendor independent. It's high visibility, consensus, and maintainability. So what you learn in web technology, you will be able to use in 10 years' time. What you learn in iOS now, probably not, because it will be replaced with something completely new. Which, again, if that's what you want to do, if you just want to build a game now that makes you money in the next half year, that then gets thrown away, Go for iOS, no problem whatsoever. If you want to build an HTML5 application and give it the same love that you give that, that it's going to be, you need that browser and that resolution and that connection speed, you're not releasing an HTML5 app. You're hoping that end users have the stuff that they want. So for an HTML5 solution to be as good as a native implementation, it only has to work on one browser, on one operating system, on one defined piece of hardware, and in one specific specification. If you want to compare one to one, that's what we need to do. So make it work on, an, uh, on a newest MacBook Air in Safari in that configuration on your computer, because that's exactly what a native app is. And that is exactly against everything the web stands for and what HTML5 was invented for. So the comparison between the two is rather pointless. But the press loves to do that. So that's why I'm standing in, in interviews all the time like, no, yes, this Firefox OS phone is a bit slower than your iPhone. It also costs a tenth of your iPhone and is available in the country where I bought it, where the iPhone isn't. 
So why do you compare these two things? It's like a Formula One car and a Lada. Like, yeah, this one is available for a student as his first car. The other one doesn't make much sense to park in the middle of Budapest. <laughs> and I see worrying trends. I see things going backwards again. I love the web. I love to, that we can publish things worldwide and get them translated for us. But I see things like this. The other day I went to uh, look for unicorn poop cookies, as you do. And I went to Instructables, and they have an explanation how to make unicorn poop, unicorn poop cookies. And then they asked me to download their app, which is called Unicorn Poop App. Which it isn't, but they actually just do it for SEO, I think. And what is the point of this? I'm typing in a URL, I'm finding something in a Google search result, I'm following a link, and then I go to a website that tells me to download an app. I want the information about how to make unicorn poop cookies, not download 20 meg of app so you can show me your ads. This is the same with it with pop-up windows, it's the same with it with flash tunnels. Just because it's useful for you to have an app doesn't mean the end user should suffer a full download of that, especially in countries where you pay per megabyte. The other one is the iPad Air website when that came out the other day, and I'm like, ooh, do I want an iPad Air? I was in a hotel in San Francisco, and I couldn't download the whole website. It stuck halfway through. Because the website is 34.6 meg with 178 requests. Because it does the scrolly thing where it just shows you everything instead of just being a website that tells me what the bloody iPad is about. And uh, uh, there was a great talk, uh, uh, a great uh, a blog post by Trent Walton called Scroll Hijacking. And it said, there comes a time in every URL's life where it needs to decide whether it wants to be a PowerPoint, a movie, or an actual website. And we're doing that right now. We're making these movies in HTML5 and call them like websites. If I cannot highlight it, if I cannot jump through it, if I can't search for the thing, it's not a website. Stop doing that kind of stuff. It's reinventing Flash. So what are the benefits of the web? Why is the web a good thing? A lot of times we forget just how cool it really is. First of all, we've got millions of developers. They come in all shapes and sizes. You know the people that go up to you and say, like, I know JavaScript, and all they do is use jQuery. And people who basically just as designers and call themselves developers, and that's OK. That's totally fine. The web was made so people can participate. When I see people in China, in Africa, in India building their first websites from scratch with the Inside the Web Maker project from Mozilla, where we teach people the basics of the web, it's gorgeous. It's not that you should have an Ivy League degree or have a certain degree in computer science before you're allowed to write software. This is not what software is about. This is a new publishing medium and we should embrace it. Incredible reach. This is the connectivity during the day at a certain time. So the, the, the redder it is, the more people are connected. So that's the time when it's, when it's actually night in Brazil. And, uh, well, daytime in Brazil. I wished all of that were black. Uh, I wished all of them were light, where everybody could be connected. But sadly enough, it's not the case yet. But mobile, we're almost connected worldwide by now. The problem is we only have old, uh, old phones. Customizable experiences. There's this website called Habrabrabraru, and uh, they do great stuff about, uh, about CSS and HTML5. I don't know Russian, I don't know what's going on there, but, and I use Chrome, for example, I can translate that thing for me. Why not? The end user is in full control over your website and can, can improve it for them. Atomic updates. Why should I download 40 meg for a new level of a game when I could just download the, the level of the game, the level data, which is like a few K? And with App Cache, I can do that. App Store independence. Why, oh why, oh why do I have to go to a shop to put my piece of software in there and hope people buy it? We have the internet. We don't go to the shop anymore and buy CDs and floppy disks and install it from there. We, we have the internet to get information. And when, I get, uh, when, I, when I'm in America, I just bought a new laptop, I want to buy a piece of software, when I get home and it tells me, oh, you're in England, that's a third world country, obviously you don't get American software. I just go crazy. This is not what we, what we fought for. Now, how do we tackle HTML5 issues? And this is going to go now in Firefox OS, not because I want to sell it to you, but because we're the only platform that is written in HTML5 and solves a lot of these issues. <coughs> and nothing in HTML5 and Firefox OS is for Firefox only. Everything is open source. Everything is allowed for other browsers to implement as well. And a few things are being implemented in other browsers right now. We're the hardcore test because we build a phone that is based on HTML5. Now, first facts. Released in eight countries, Spain, Poland, Venezuela, Peru, Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, and Germany. 
18 mobile operators, 7 hardware partners, lots of hardware options, aimed at emerging markets, the low-end market. This is not competing with iOS and Android. This is bringing phones to people who cannot get iPhones, who cannot get Android phones that are new. You basically get second, third, third hand uh, Android phones that have a really old Android and that really horrible stock browser on them. It's aimed to be an alternative to feature phones, you know, upgrading the ones that have snakes and text messages on them and that's about it. So these are the ones that we want to replace. And we replace them with phones that are super affordable. This is the LG uh, FireWeb that's being released in Brazil. And it looks beautiful. It's basically like another, like another smartphone, except the price is, in this case, about $80. And in, uh, in Spain, you can buy for 69 euro a phone from Deutsche Telekom and Asmari, uh, from Telefonica, who already has 30 euro apps on it. And it's unlocked, not, not to one provider. You can put any SIM card that you want in. And it basically is for somebody who wants to have their first smartphone without breaking the bank. The first thing we have to tackle when it comes to HTML5 is security, because the web inherently is insecure, because JavaScript being not dependent on the domain, but you can inject any JavaScript from everywhere. That was a big mistake when JavaScript was invented, but it was invented in 10 days, so let's give the, uh, Brandon Ike a bit of a tip here. So the first thing to do to turn an HTML page into an, into an application for Firefox OS or the open web is write a manifest file that tells us this is an app. Here's where it is, here are the icons, here's who wrote it. So you actually can say, now give me a bit more things than a normal website should have. Install me, make me full screen rather than just show me in a browser. Web content, like HTML5 pages, mobile optimized HTML5 pages that we have there is the first level of security. They don't get any special access to the hardware, but they get things that work. IndexedDB works, AppCache works, WebGL works, all the things that we get promised in HTML work in Firefox or S because it is an HTML5 operating system. Nothing in this is actually C Sharp or, uh, or Java or anything like that. You can write the whole operating system in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you can download it from GitHub as well. An installed web application gets, uh, is packaged up, so that gets more access to the hardware. A privileged web application tells the user what hardware they want to have extra. Like, I want to access the camera, I want to access the address book, and the end user says yes or no. A certified web application is the ones that make up the operating system itself, the dialer, the text messaging app, the camera app, and these are built by Mozilla and partners. So you're probably not going to build one of those, but you don't need to as well, of course, there's another way to access the hardware, but I'm going to show that later. You ask for permissions in your manifest file as well. So that one, it says like, I want to read and create contacts, and I want to set alarms. So the end user, when they install the application, basically says, okay, these two things I allow it to do. These are all dynamic as well. So if people install your app and later on they want to have access to more of your phone, all you have to do is change the manifest file and the end user gets asked. Not like it is an Android where you have to ask for everything up front and you can never change it again unless you uninstall and reinstall the thing. Hardware <coughs> access. How do you access the hardware? With JavaScript. These are the web APIs. All the things that you can do in Firefox OS and some of them across other browsers, like the Vibration API, which allows you to vibrate the, the, the phone, is now available in latest Chrome as well. Yesterday it got, that one got released. All of these are open specifications sent to the W3C and implemented across different browsers. How do they work? Battery status, like how do I want to know how much battery is left on the computer? This is how you do it. Battery, ba uh, battery is navigated of battery, battery level, get 100%, round it down. Is it, is it charging? That's a boolean. How long does it take to charge? How long does it take to discharge? And you've got event listeners asking for different things about the battery. This works in Chrome, this, uh, this works in Firefox, this works in Opera, and another, uh, a few other browsers are actually implementing that one as well. This is cool, because I could, for example, realize that the, that the browser is like, the, that the computer is 20% down on battery, and then I don't show all the animations. My, my application should be clever enough to let users use it for as long as possible, not give it the, the best experience and burn down my battery in a few minutes. So that's a great opportunity there. Vibration API. You want to make the phone vibrate? Navigator.vibrate1000. This vibrates it for a second. 
Uh, if you put an array in there, it actually vibrates it for 200 milliseconds, pauses for 100, 200 milliseconds, pauses for 100. Of course, the first thing we've done when we implemented that is write a Morse code app that actually makes the phone vibrate and the other one read it. So. <laughs> Network information API. Uh, are we connected? Yes. If the bandwidth is more than zero, then we're online. If it's metered, then it tells you that it's metered. So that's a good idea to say, like, okay, the end user has so and so many Macs left this month for download. Maybe I should not ask them to download the 3.5 gig of, of videos and images like the Bart's Tale does on Android. Um, page visibility, very important. Uh, that one is an event listener on visibility change. If the document is hidden, then you know that the app is currently hidden. If it's not, then the app is being used. So this is great for realizing if the user is using the app right now or not. It's a bit like the tab visibility API in Chrome and Firefox on desktop. If you don't want to package your app, if you don't want to make a zip of it and send it to a marketplace and, ma and get, it, get a security review of it, you can also use web activities. Web activities are like intense on Android. So instead of asking the user to give me access to their camera, all I do is ask the user to give me a, a picture. Because that's what my app needs in the end. This is what it looks like. New boss activity, name pick, and type is the image, uh, image um, mind types. And then I have an on success handler and an on error handler. In the on success handler, I just create an image and I actually get the window URL create object from the result block. So this is how easy it is to get an image from the camera without having to get access to the camera because the user does it for you. So if you execute that, this is what it looks like. The user gets asked to give you a picture. So that could be from a wallpaper, from the gallery, or from the camera. You don't need to know what the user uses. You just want to have a photo. So that makes the user secure because they choose what they want to do to get the picture in there. And it keeps you secure because you don't get access to the camera that could be abused. What if you want to ask, uh, distribute your app? Of course, when you write apps, you want to get people to get them somehow. The normal way of doing that is a marketplace. And people love marketplaces because they come with the phone. They don't have to understand URLs. They don't have to understand anything. And we have one as well. The marketplace is where you can list your applications for Firefox OS or for desktop. And there people can put the reviews in. There you can do your monetization. There people can actually pay for your apps up front. But you can also do in-app payments if you want to actually make, app, make money later on. These are available for Firefox OS, Android, Windows, OS X, and Linux. So if Firefox is available on any of these computers, you can run these applications full screen as applications on all these different platforms by sticking to that open app uh, specification, which is just writing the manifest file. That's why people like Amazon, that's why people like Sencha, that's why people like PhoneGap are now interested in implementing that as well, because it's something that everybody needs right now. And you can also install from the web. If you don't want to go through the marketplace, you don't like us, you already have a website that's super successful, and you just want people to install an app from that one, all you have to do is call this JavaScript. Install app, navigator, mouse apps, install, point to the manifest URL, and then you can install or not install the application, and you get an on success handler and on error handler back. Tooling is the biggest issue. Everybody, I, I just spoke at a .NET Java conference, and everybody asked me, what's the IDE to build the web with? The I, like, whatever you want to use. So there's no one IDE to actually make web development with, but people want good tooling, I understand that. It's like there's, there's, uh, when you don't know where an error came from, when you don't know where memory is being lost, that's not good. So this is what developer environment for Firefox OS looks like. It's the browser. So this is Firefox on the right hand side. If you just open the app manager in Firefox, you get this. Then you connect the Firefox OS phone and it shows up in your, uh, in your uh, app manager. So this one connects to the phone. On the phone I says yes. And then I can put my first app on the phone from my hard drive. This is just an index.html with a manifest file, and it installs it onto the phone. If you want to do that from the web, you can do that as well. It doesn't have to be on your hard drive. It can be on your GitHub account, for example. And you install the application from there. Now, installing and uninstalling applications via USB is not good, uh, good enough. We also want to debug. So this one is the developer tools that are already in Firefox, that you're already using on the desktop. And that one allows you to edit the application while it's running. 
So in this case, I can now rename the button in there to something else and prototype the changes that way without having to repackage my app and re, uh, recalculate everything. I have uh, JavaScript access to the phone, so I can actually do an alert right now that shows up on the phone. And I also have a complete CSS debugging. Now, if you don't have a device, you can also use the simulator. The simulator is just an add-on to Firefox where you can run the simulator and all of a sudden you have a simulated phone on your computer. And there, that is where I do 90% of my work because I don't like to work on the phone itself. It's just the phone itself you only need for hardcore <laughs> performance testing. So as everything in the operating system itself is HTML5, we can mess, for example, with the settings application. The settings application is a certified application, but still, as it's not right now in the emulator, I can play with that. So the little uh, HRs between the different settings, let's turn them to red. Or if we don't like the size of them, let's make them bigger. Let's give them a bit of margin just by putting the CSS in there. And out of a sudden, there's a bit more space between them. And all of that is live in the browser. If you take the CSS out, this is what the HTML looks like. And if you put it back in, this is what it looks like. So you don't need to repackage. You don't need to redistribute. You do it live on the computer. You tap on something on the phone to start editing it. And then you can start renaming it to something else. So for simple prototyping, when you show guys things to a client, this is wonderful. And it also allows you to learn from other applications, like, for example, from the settings app, what it looks like. The home screen itself is also HTML5. So we can now take, for example, all these icons from all the different apps that have been installed and change them in CSS. So I go into my CSS style, and now I rotate them by 90 degrees just by doing a transform rotate 90 degrees. And out of a sudden, all the icons are being turned to 90 degrees. Try to do that on iOS. Try to do that on, uh, on Android. You can also scale them to make them unusable, but that's what the developers do. But it just shows how much power you have over it. You can also list all the applications that have been installed on your phone and see their permissions. So if there's a permission model problem, you see it in a, in a very simple way in this kind of environment. And you can run the applications one by one to try them out as well. So you could, uh, you could do an automated testing of all the applications on the phone from the emulator. And if you want to, you can open it in the browser as well in a new tab, because it's just HTML5. It's nothing magic. Google does similar things. They have this web designer that they just brought out, which is a what you see is what you get editor to make HTML5 ads with it. This came originally from Motorola. When they bought Motorola, they just got that in. And that's kind of cool. I want to see these kind of things. I don't want people have to buy Illustrator, make an app, and then convert it somehow to HTML5. You can do that directly in the browser. Adobe Edge does the same things. They are, they have, they are available for free for, uh, for students as well, I think. And there you can actually take things from PSDs and turn them into HTML5 and CSS. So everybody works on tooling for HTML5 right now. Sencha is a massive company that actually gives you tooling for HTML5 and it's used by many, many people and I'm working with them right now to support Firefox OS completely. PhoneGap is basically the main stop when you want to turn HTML5 into native applications to make an Android app or an iOS app from your HTML. What else is happening? What's cooking? What's coming down the line? This is all pretty cool, but we always want to have new things and there's a few things that Flash could do, for example, that HTML5 couldn't do yet. So, for example, web components. Web components are super interesting. Right now, every time we make a widget, every time we make a tab group, every time we make a calendar, every time we make these kind of things, we're working against the browser. The browser is busy 60 times a second painting a screen from your CSS, from your JavaScript, from your HTML. This is just how projectors work. This is how screens work. The browser does that for you, and it just paints things. And when you start animating in CSS or creating new things, when people click on something, you basically go to the browser and say, like, hey, the browser, I'm busy, go away. And you're like, hey, paint this new thing, please. In the developer tools, you can actually turn that on with repainting. If you go to any website, now I'm going to mess with my presentation again here. If you go to any website, for example, this one here, and you do the <coughs> inspect element, you can press this, uh, this thing here. And every time something happens to the screen, you see that the coloring changes here. So that basically tells you that something is happening. So that's the repaints that the browsers have to do. 
And the more of those you do, the more annoying it will get for the browser and the slower your application will get. So, so far there was no way around that, sadly enough, because the browser didn't give, give us access to, these, to, uh, to the rendering. With web components we do. So with a web component I can write HTML, CSS and JavaScript and make it part of the rendering flow. I just give it to the browser and when the browser paints the picture already it just takes my stuff in as well. So I don't need to wait for the browser to finish painting before I tell it to do something, but the browser paints my widget while it's doing it. This allows you to build things like tab controls that are independent of the, the performance of the browser. They actually is part of it. The other thing that web components do is that you can build a tab control that does not get the CSS from the rest of the page, which is always a big problem, like the, the, the comic source font that somebody defined in the body goes into your tabs and makes them look bad. With web components, I've got, uh, I've got a, a atomic component that just is independent of the rest of the DOM. So I paint things that way and I control my CSS that way. There's customelements.io, which is a very, very simple uh, repository of all these elements that you can start downloading and using in Chrome, in uh, Safari, in, in, uh, in Firefox, and maybe soon in Internet Explorer. Not quite sure yet. Uh, Google is very much into web components as well. They built this polygraph framework, which has worked a lot of times together with AngularJS. So that one allows you to use uh, web components as well across browsers. We built something called Mozilla Brick, and all the new things that are coming in Firefox OS, all the new applications, are built with Mozilla Brick because we want them to be faster, use less battery, and be actually easier to use. So instead of having to use a, tab con uh, a flip box like here and know the JavaScript and the CSS of it, all you have to do is say X flip box and define the front face and the back face, and the rest is done, rendered like that for you. And with the toggle flip, you can animate it back and forth and you get a JavaScript access to that one to apply event handlers on it. But you don't need to know the JavaScript that makes the flipping happen and what the HTML under it is. You just have an XFlip box instead. WebRTC is a super interesting thing as well, which is basically peer-to-peer -peer connectivity of computers. So instead of having to go through a server for everything that you do for a multiplayer game, for example, you allow users to connect with each other. So that way you can do audio chat, you can do video chat, you can use BitTorrent over the browser if you wanted to, or you can just send data back and forth in a back channel without actually making the interface slower. Google Hangouts works with that and works immensely well. I was really excited the other day when I couldn't go to Korea and I gave a presentation in the, at the Korean conference at home in my house over Google Hangouts. And that worked. I didn't need to, need to use Skype, I didn't need to use anything, I just used my browser and gave a talk in Korea. We have a thing called togetherjs.com which, uh, which is a JavaScript that you just pop in the page and then you get collaborative tools to actually work with people on the same page. So what you have is a chat client where people can chat with each other, an audio chat client where people can talk to each other while they're actually editing in the same page and every editor has his own little uh, uh, um, arrow, his own little cursor. So you have the cursor with the name on it and you can write a document together with that. All you have to do is put the JavaScript in and there's lots and lots of cool examples like this one here. Oh no, that's another one. But where is that? That's what it looks like. You basically, you, uh, you put this JavaScript in your page and then you got the features that you want to have. So you have an audio chat, a text chat, or a, a user focus. So this one now is two people here chatting with each other and writing some HTML together at the same time. So you can see there are two cursors and uh, where they are, what they're typing right now, and you can see them editing an HTML document together. And this is just enabled by just putting this JavaScript in your page and initializing it. You can also put that inside uh, Mozilla Thimble and in JS Fiddle. So this is actually an audio chat that you can't hear right now, but it's these two people chatting actually to each other and editing HTML at the same time. And this is really cool. I mean, SubEther Edit tried to do something like that on the desktop. Other tools had collaborative editing, but now we have it in the browser as browsers are actually capable of these kind of things. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about quickly is uh, performance and making things work. 60 frames per second, Google is all over that. Like, oh, it is lower than that, then kittens die and people steal your money and you've got to be really, really good at that. Because otherwise people feel it's, it's, it's not right. 
This is the kind of performance that we want to achieve. So this is, uh, where's my water? I'm spending far too much time actually playing this game right now. <laughs> and uh, this is what it looks like on a Nexus 4. So it has a massive uh, physics thing going on. So you basically, you switch there, and you see the water coming down and splitting, and it's like, all of this is like really sweet and really, really fast. Except, this is not the native where's my water. This is HTML5, and this is not a normal, uh, this is not a normal Nexus 4, but it's a rooted Nexus 4 that runs Firefox in it. <laughs> so, what we've done here is we worked with Disney Interactive, the guys who actually built Where's My Water, and we used ASM, uh, 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 Mscripten and ASM.js to actually convert their C++ game directly to JavaScript. So they didn't have to learn JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, they just gave us their bytecode and we converted it for them. So with this, we also have the Unreal 3D engine now in the desktop browser. The Unreal 4 engine is in the making as well. So it's for C++ guys who have 10 years of experience of building great tools. Why should they learn JavaScript? They don't have to. Because we have development tools that allow us to convert one to the other right now. So I would love people to start with JavaScript and HTML and CSS. It's great. It's fun. But if you already have a tool, why not convert it? And this is where we're going with this as well. It's called ASM.js and Scripton. ASM.js is just a subset of JavaScript that's uh, pre-compiled and, uh, and memory optimized. And Mscripten is the tool to turn LLVM bytecode from Java or C into JavaScript directly. And if you want to use HTML5 now, what should you do? Well, first of all, stay up to date. Learn from where things are happening. Listen to, listen to Google, listen to Apple, <laughs> listen to Google, listen to Mozilla, listen to Microsoft, see what they're doing. Stop reading TechCrunch and think that's HTML5 information. This is there to make headlines so people click on ads so they make money. This is what, what all the tech press is about. So learn from the people where it's happening and please give us feedback. If you think something is incredibly stupid, it should not happen. It's, HTML5 is developed for you guys, for developers. Oh, me as well. But uh, it's, it's not there to actually keep browsers better and sell more browsers. It's there to make your life easier. So if things go into the specifications that are just stupid because nobody gave us feedback, that's sad. Think mobile and off offline first. Offline is super important. I'm always in hotels, I'm always in airports, I'm always in countries where connectivity is just a dream, like America. And then I'm getting very frustrated if I have a game or I have something on my phone that does not work or ask me to connect to a server first. That doesn't have to be. Offline functionality is working. IndexedDB, App Cache, all of these things are available to you. And think about a mobile environment first because that's where the next users are coming. The, the next users are not coming through desktop, they're going to come through mobile phones. Flexibility is your superpower. These are all the, all, this is all the hardware you have to support. And that is not even including the Windows machines. Does your thing have to look the same on all of them? Not at all. Should it work on all of them? Yes. And the only technology that allows you to do that is web technology right now. All the others are fixed in a certain state. And why should you leave these end users out there that might have a lot of money and want to buy your application? You can make it work in different phases and according to different hardware. The big thing is an if statement. If the hardware can do that, then do it. Not do it and wait the hardware is allowing to do it. And be fearless, just jump in. Jump into the puddle. Of course it's dirty, of course it's messy, but it's fun. I mean, I, I looked like that as a kid, not like a girl, but <laughs> I looked that dirty. And it was fun. My parents didn't like it much, but they realized, like, okay, he learned something today and brought things back into the house. It was pretty good. So if you want to play with that, and if you already have an HTML5 application or a mobile website that is ready to be HTML5 mobile app to optimize for an operating system like Firefox OS, 23rd of November in Budapest, um, we have a workshop where, you, where our experts and partners from Deutsche Telekom and Telenor, I think, are coming. And they help you build your application for Firefox OS or convert your application to Firefox OS. You get a phone to test on. You get a phone you to play with. Uh, food and drink is available as well. We don't have hotels and travel for you, but that can be sorted out uh, amongst you. So go outside, talk to the Firefox people there, and we can work together on this. Almost 
uh, well, about a few hundred apps that are in the marketplace right now have been uh, created at these workshops because people come in, have a few problems, never had an idea, we help them out fixing them. We converted NeoJS, the JavaScript uh, library that all the WebOS devices were running on, at a workshop like that in like a few hours. So if you want to play with Firefox OS and you have something already ready, come to this workshop and or do it, uh, do it online. Of course, you don't have to go to a workshop to do it. If you're, if you're clever enough, you can do it yourself. Because Hungary is one of the next markets. So can't give you a date, but it's really, really soon. So Firefox OS will be out here as well. And I'm going to buy a few phones for my mom, for example, because she couldn't do an iPhone. And that's all I have. So thanks very much. <laughs>